today. Um, I really appreciate you getting up an hour early and showing up and being here for the weather. Um, it looks as though it's supposed to get better at two, so stay all day, catch all the <laughs> and the roads will be much better when you go home this afternoon. Yeah. Um, so my name is Mike Briggs. I am, I have to admit this, this is like standing up in front of a group of people and admitting I'm a marketer. Um, I, I like to think that you know all of us will someday be marketers. So today uh, I'm going to be talking about testing user experience um, and really focusing uh, exclusively on website success here. Um, and the title sort of like pulls it all out. Everything we're going to cover today um, is about uh, making sure people's websites are functioning better, um, increasing the success from them, and, and doing it by by actually measuring and testing against real honest to goodness users. Uh, so we'll have a lot of information through as we go through this. Um, I do have like 30 something slides um, with some case studies and some examples and some very solid tactical uh, information. But I want to make this as uh, interactive as possible. So feel free to catch my attention and ask a question as we go through if you'd like. Um, let's see, all right, my little clicker didn't work. Um, a real brief history of Mike. Um, funny enough, in 1992, I earned a degree in fisheries biology. Um, yes, I'm a marketer now. Um, <laughs> and for about seven years, I was involved in the fisheries business. Then the internet sort of did this big thing that we've all heard about. So in 99, I left fisheries to go start an e-commerce store with a friend of mine. Um, and you know that segued into since 2001 or so. Uh, in 2002, I got my first AdWords account, and for the last 20 years, I've done nothing but digital marketing um, and watched it as the market for digital marketing itself is segmented and bifurcated, and it's just turned into a, a snake pit of, of opportunity, but also pitfalls. Um, so, so that's where we got to here. But I also have to say real quick, this is a little bit of a homecoming for me. That fisheries biology seven years was actually done right here at UMass uh, with the Fish and Wildlife Service Cooperative Unit that still exists here. On any given day, you could see me doing weird things like this, standing in a stream with rubber boots and rubber gloves on, running an electric current through the water. Uh, in retrospect, it doesn't seem like it's that smart a thing to do, but it was certainly enjoyable. Um, it just wasn't a lifelong path for me. Um, so like I said, I took an opportunity to go do something completely different. Um, and it, it, this, this just goes to show that if you can be a fisheries biologist, and then be assimilated into the marketing world, resistance really is for the people. It's the board, we're all gonna be marketers. So. <laughs> so join me on this path. Oops. Um, so today, I'm gonna to just walk through a few different areas. Um, first one is why bother with this whole process of testing. Um, as you all know, especially the designers here, a lot of work goes up front into a website. Um, there's a lot of planning and a lot of research and some very solid basis for how things are launching, so why do we even bother with the testing? Um, and once I convince you that there may be a value to it, we'll walk through a number of uh, types of measurement that I use um, and that people use, as well as a number of different types of testing, um, and then some ideas on how you may be able to incorporate those into your own processes as well. And then we'll try to wrap it up with some, uh, some platforms and some case studies just to get some ideas out there on you know, how you may be able to, to do some of these things yourself. Um, so the first thing, why test it all? So again, as a marketer, I'm tasked typically with one simple job that my clients, clients as they outline it, and that's to take a dollar and turn it into stacks of hundreds. Um, sure, easy task, we'll just go play some ads, but often what's in the way of that uh, is a website. You know, we, we have to funnel everybody online through various websites. You know, we know how to do a lot of targeting online, making sure our ads show up to the right person at the right time, but then they invariably wind up here, and they have to get something done. And in order to be a successful marketer, we have to make sure that we have a successful website on the other side. And then behind that website, we got a whole bunch of people doing different things. They're different people, they're in different places. Uh, even if you think you know your demographics and your, your personas, they're still all individuals who are acting on this website differently. And as you probably know after launch, in highly unpredictable ways. Um, so, so the task that I have here is to figure out a way to not only make our ads work smarter, 
but to funnel people through a website that needs to be going through constant improvements in order to prove the value um, of an ad dollar or the value of a business model at all. Um, so this is one of the areas where testing comes in. <clears throat> I know we talk a lot about, from the designer standpoint, um, a persona and coming up with a representation of the customer. And it's great, I mean, there's no way, there's, there's no substituting the fact that when you're launching a new product, a new business, or a new website, you have to have that in mind. But the reality is, is no one, no five personas um, that you try to capture for a website is the same thing as 5,000 different Franks out there that are inter interacting with the website at a given time. Um, so that's where this testing again comes in, is it's gonna start putting real world examples um, to, to these sort of generalizations that we use during the design process. And then this is one of our favorites. Um, you know, part of the, the company Paragon, we are a web dev company as well as a marketing company. <laughs> Who hasn't done this? You've got a great website idea, we just have 17 little changes we want to make to it. And as you can imagine, 17 tweaks later, your great idea is no longer even represented on the page anymore. Um, so testing is another great way to bust through this design by committee approach where everybody's got a great idea what they want to see on the website. And data speaks volumes. Um, opinions matter, but data actually makes the decision at the end of the day. So a lot of these testing approaches that we're going to use here uh, are a way to make sure that you can answer people's questions about their great idea with an actual example and actual users. Should have grabbed more coffee. <laughs> we get thirsty. Um, so some of the ideas, you know, just to summarize a little bit of this, why you should uh, why you should test and the powers of testing go along. The first one is it's a way to collect thousands of opinions from real people in real environments trying to accomplish real tasks. Uh, we've set up the group before. You know, you get your friend to visit the website. Uh, hey, pretend you're going to go buy a pair of socks um, on your mobile device and let me watch what's going on. And, and invariably, that sort of user group winds up being, no, no, click there. You know, you're, you're guiding the person no matter how much. And they're trying to please you. They're not trying to do the task. So this is an opportunity to actually get these people, um, they're still on the bus. They're on the mobile device on the bus, and they may have to get something done before they get off. Or you know, they're in line at the bank, or they're at work, and their boss is coming around the corner. Um, so I mean, this is an opportunity to measure exactly what's going on. You can iterate, repeat, try again, give it a shot. I mean, it is so simple um, to get these things done that you just keep doing it because there's almost zero cost, there's almost zero risk, and there's really little blowback to measuring and testing in a live environment like this. Um, it's not like you're committing a ton of resources to a whole new website design. You're making iterative, small approach changes as you go, and, and you're learning to see what you're going to do in the next couple weeks. You get a real answer to all your what if questions. You know, what if I change that navigation? What if you know, we did these different things? Um, you could test that really dumb idea that somebody gave you. Um, you know, it just might end up working in the end. I, I hate that, but it, it actually happens. Uh, you get to try it before you buy it, and you'll be in good company. Um, these three people are here because Amazon and Google and Overstock are, are well, well known for running dozens of tests in a, any given week. Um, I do it all the time. I go to Amazon and then I'll go visit on a different browser and you'll see slightly different uh, interfaces when you're there. Uh, Google especially is always giving you a different search result. Um, you can run three different browsers, search the exact same term in the exact same area and it's very likely one of those three is going to be different because they realize that testing on their real users with real changes and measuring the results is the only way to get there. Um, but you know, so I get asked a lot, uh, you know, what would be the right time to test my website? And I really try to break it down into three times that are ideal for website testing. One is before redesign. Um, you know, anybody who's involved in a website redesign project now or a website launch, you know, when's the last time you launched a brand new website for somebody? You know, 90% of websites now are being redesigned. You have an opportunity before you design and launch a new website to test the old one. 
get some ideas out there. You know, we're thinking about making this change or a modification. You put them out there and measure before you design your new site so that you've got a little head start with the new site. And then even after you've done it, like immediately after, in the immediate aftermath of a site launch, um, start measuring your visitor behavior. Um, see if they're doing what you want them to do. You're obviously probably doing this through like Google Analytics or whatever analytics package of choice is just to measure conversion rates, engagement rates. But here's a way to do it on a micro scale. See where they're going and what they're doing. And then the third time is all the times in between. Um, so, so basically, you should be testing a website almost continuously if you want this to be a productive website. Um, no matter how small a website, there's always something you can be doing to make it better. Um, obviously, if you've got, uh, you know, all websites will eventually have a 100% exit rate. They're going to leave. But unless 100% of the people are leaving your website through your contact form, um, you probably still have some room for, for improvement. So, so make sure that you're always be testing. Um, so my general take on the process, um, and it is a cyclical process, um, one that we continue, we, we consider never done. Um, but typically we start with the hypothesis. You know. We look and say, hey, you know, we need to get X from the site, we need to increase sales. But we hypothesize, where are people not doing this? Where are they dropping off? Where are we missing the mark? Um, but then, and I actually stole this, this cycle from a number of places, and, and to a T, all the testing companies will jump you right into num step number three, create versions um, and begin testing. And, and I think probably the most important step that, uh, that people don't do in this process is to measure a baseline. Um, you think you come up with an idea that people don't like my pricing scheme. Um, you have to measure where you're at now, see what they're doing. And I've got, you know, the next five slides or so will be exactly how do we measure. Um, and how do we start collecting this data? But don't forget to measure the baseline. It's so critical. Then you can actually start to see, based on what I'm seeing my visitors do, um, I can create some versions to try to you know, solve some of the problems, relieve, relieve some of the friction of the site, make something a little easier. Then as that site, the, as the page, the test goes out, um, you measure and analyze, um, collect the data, choose a winner, hopefully, um, and then after that, you reiterate, go back to the beginning and see how that's performing. You mentioned, you, you start with hypothesis. You didn't mention it. When you're, I would have thought your hypothesis comes from having seen a baseline mm -hmm. and said, gee, you know, yeah. this page doesn't perform as well as you'd like or expect. Did well, you mention it when you said that you think it's based on your prices and you have to go Yeah. Yeah, so we, you know, typically the hypothesis that, that I come at it from is driven by a weakness in some kind of key performance indicator that we're after. So our return on ad spend is too low. We're bringing in people from an advertising program and the click through or the bounce rate is too high. So yeah, we, I do jump into that sort of assuming you know your business and what your business goals are. The hypothesis is why do you think people aren't doing what you want them to do. Yeah, I think that's my question. Are you yeah. always starting with, I think this might be the answer, and let's figure out how to measure whether I'm right? Yeah. Yeah, I would say, yeah, if anything, what, what needed to be sort of over top all of that is you have a business goal. You have those key performance indicators, and people simply aren't doing what, what you want in enough volume. What do you do when that hypothesis is something like, I could be getting more business? Yeah. Yeah, something really vague, really open-ended like that. Where do you start from? Where do you say, well, we'll go analyze your business and come back and you know kind of what you want? Yeah. Or you could just like, go in that same field or doing other websites. Yeah. Well, you know, that would be a whole other presentation, I think. We could certainly uh, go into good business goals. And uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's a huge part of what we spend our time doing is helping clients realize that I want more business isn't a goal. That's mm -hmm. sort of the dream. 
and to outline it. So prior to this part, hopefully you've defined what business means to you, what an increase in leads means to you, an increase in qualified, marketing ready, sales ready, you know, all this mumbo jumbo that belongs in this room because it is a boardroom after all. Um, so yeah, I definitely sort of skip that whole process. Plus whatever you're, if you're designing the website or you're trying to have one designed for you, you usually go in with a set of ideas yeah. and that would be the hypothesis. Exactly. That's well, yeah. And the hypothesis, well, how do you think you're missing? You know, where, where do you think that's not working? Um, and then like, you go look and see, is that true? And like I say, so, you know, you can jump right into measuring and it may actually jump start some ideas. Um, we do that too. Once in a while, we'll just set up some mapping programs, collect some visitor behavior, see what they're doing to the site, and that will actually make the light bulb go off and say, holy crap, I didn't realize nobody even noticed that. Um, yeah, case in point, when I say don't skip the, the baseline, this maybe if you don't really have an idea already where you think things are falling down, you just put up some heat maps or some click maps and visitor recordings and you'll find, you know, are they seeing and interacting with the content that you've got on the page or are they completely ignoring it? Um, are they abandoning a form? Um, are they ignoring calls to action? Are they not scrolling? There's just so many things you can see just by measuring their initial impact of the website. And here's an example. Um, so I'm going to just walk through it's five or six, I'll know when I get to the end, five or six measurement tools that we use um, to t lay down the baseline. These are the same tools that we use for measuring success of the test. Um, the first one is probably your largest scale pattern that you can collect from anything, and that is basically a scroll map. Uh, what it does is tells you how far down a page your average visitors are getting. Uh, and it can be quite eye-opening to people, especially people who like to put a lot of content on one page and think that it's all super critical to their customers. And what they discover is that 50% of the people are gone before they get to 30% of the content. Well, that might be good, right? Because they found exactly what they were looking for. They clicked off. Not a bad, not a bad thing. Um, before I just go off on that, um, so you can, you can use to see where they're scrolling past. There are different tools that can control, and this is when you get into the tactics and the details. Uh, if you have internal page links that give me the ability to click on the top of the page and you drop down to the bottom, there's a couple tools that will control for that. And you'll actually see hotspots down here. Um, but you know, most sites don't use those, so this is kind of typical. And like I say, so you might think, you know, this is wonderful, you know, the visitors aren't scrolling far because they're finding what they want. So then you look at the other map on the same page, which is called a heat slash click map. And this is where people are actually, inter actually interacting with the page. Mm. You recognize this page. <laughs> and what we discover is now you've got a whole bunch of people who are interacting with the top. And then by the time they get here to the second, third, fourth level of offerings of the same thing, which were case studies, which were uh, beautiful examples of hardwood flooring in a home, they don't give a crap anymore. That's what we call a content desert. They were just, by that point in time, they were scrolling because they either had to go back or find out if this page ever ends. And then when they did get down there, what did they do? They collect highly into more, more properties. And then what we saw in the heat maps, those was the same thing. These people were just not, not finding what they wanted to, so much so that they started interacting with, Lord forbid, the footer. Um, so, so anyway, I mean, this is just a good example to see. You know, the client realized quite quickly that this was not a good way to present all these case studies, that they really needed to take a step back, um, and they were not getting the behavior they wanted out of their, their customers. There was so much activity in the footer that the navigation obviously was not giving them a clear path to where they wanted to go. Otherwise, they'd have found it at the top. So can you just talk to me for a minute about the difference between the scroll map and the heat map? Like, is it the same case study? Because it looks same like page. It had they, but then wouldn't the scrolling behavior have been higher with all the activity in the footer? No, because 75%, only 25% of the people got to the bottom of the page, but then they clicked heavily once they got there. Um, so that was a small set of people. 75% um, of the people either back buttoned or navigated in the top half, and a lot of them back buttoned. Um, they didn't yeah, we, click on because anything. Because we can't see that in the next page. Yeah, you can't see a back button. But then, by the time that 25% got down here, they wanted just to do something else. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, they, thank they, you. They were so frustrated. Um, cool. 
So then <coughs> another really powerful tool is the form analysis. And this one allows us to see, set up a form, track the interactions with all the different fields. Wonderful tool when people say, I absolutely have to collect email. And then you bring it up to them, but do you have to collect it to the point where 30% of the people are bailing on you because you're asking for an email when they want a print material sent to their house? You know, this is where you can quickly show people, visitors are smart, they know you don't need an email address to send me a print catalog. Um, so there's a disconnect here. Um, and you can get this for any kind of form you set up. It's like really immensely powerful. And then you can also set up funnel analysis. So if your site has a regular you know, a shopping cart or a different process um, where people have to do multiple steps to register, become a user, et cetera, you set it up in a funnel. You look for concern areas um, where people are dropping off suddenly. And this is another place to get your hypothesis, to figure out, hey, I think on the registration page, I'm asking for too much information. I need to make that a little more frictionless. Um, it's just a great way lay this baseline down, do a test, compare it against it, and you'll see whether or not you actually improve the funnel process on your way out. You can do polls too. Um, I'm not a huge proponent of polls. People lie, um, but their behaviors don't. So, but it's certainly worthwhile. You know, some people do it. Would you recommend <coughs> this product? Did you find what you were looking for today? You, if you ask that question, you're going to skew heavily towards no, because whoever said, yeah, this was a great experience. So, but, but just know that they're available. And then, so these are all done in aggregate. So these allow me to track and follow hundreds, thousands of people to a different page and see what their activity is in whole, get some big patterns. But you know what? Sometimes nothing beats that whole case study um, where you watch somebody over their shoulder and this is the digital version of watching somebody over their shoulder. Uh, we have the ability to do session recordings as well um, in real time on different devices and actually see how your users are working with your site. Um, you can get this and you can filter out all the people who bounced after 15 seconds were clearly lost and just start looking at what people are doing who have been to the site for a while. At any point, does that get creepy? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I'm a nothing's creepy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, I, anybody with a, do you have to have opt-in of some sort? Uh, no, you can record anybody. You mm -hmm. might have been recorded while you're on website. Mm -hmm. um, do they know it though? I guess. Nope. Okay, so the thing with you know, we do cookies. <laughs> that big thing that comes up on every website is a pain in the neck. Oh, this doesn't that, require cookies. Not yet. No, not at all. It's, so you it's can't done. Identify this person. You can't. Okay, that's there's, what I'm I know saying. nothing about this person. There's that's what no, I was getting at. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. There's no personally identifiable it's information. Like and but but it's a good question. So you have to be careful if you use this, mm -hmm. especially if you use it in a shopping cart. Or if someone signed in. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. And there are ways to set it up. This was a totally anonymous user. There are ways to make sure you set it up that you do not log keystrokes, all you see is star, star, star in all form fields, especially on the checkout process, and almost all of the, the providers of the service will automatically detect credit cards, wipe those out, automatically detect anything else. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's creepy, I like creepy. It's, it's super useful. No offense. Yeah, no, I get it, no, I, I knew that was coming actually. Is this a specific like, software? Or? This one is from Fresh Marketer. I do have a list on the slide, so when you do the replay too, you'll be able to see I got like 15 tools. Um, yeah, it's like, and then you can record multiple pages. So what you may have noticed is this person going back and forth the pages. Um, I don't think the intent was to have somebody, they, they almost put something in their shopping cart, and then they started looking about us, about the granola makers, and then they started reading about the blog, which, you know, this starts, I see this pattern with people, it starts to tell me, People are interested, they think they like the product, but they need the, the trust isn't there yet, right? Because they're leaving a product page after they put it in the cart to find out who are you. Yeah. So we need to start addressing who they are um, a little bit earlier on in the process. So one more thing on collecting data. Um, everything I just showed you too can be done just for the whole website. But that's not like the most super useful information because you've got a lot of people in there. You've got people who came to, say, this granola site for multiple reasons. This is when you really want to get to be friends with your marketing people. 
because I know who I'm bringing to the website through any of my ads. I'm typically targeting search ads um, for people for very specific searches, or I'm targeting you demographically on Facebook based on how many kids, grandkids you have, if you like to bike, if you like to hike, if you're into natural foods. These all matter because what we can do is set up all of these testing tools based on some very particular groups of people who are coming to the website to see whether or not they're doing this is the, this is akin to setting up your friend with the hey try to find the vegan granola on this website um, but again in real time so you can set up different veins and say all right here's a group of people who are coming to my website looking for vegan granola um, so work with people if you don't have the power yourself to measure more intent um, and get a better answer um, to your data um, so you could set up you know, you can set these up to say only start mapping when people have landed through organic search on the vegan granola page, because we can be pretty certain they hit there from a vegan granola search on Google. How are they interacting? Are they finding the granola they want? What are they doing? You know, help your marketing friends with the, you know, or get help from marketing friends on mapping out very specific Facebook ads that you're running. Um, and if they're not running ads, run a small ad campaign just to test user intent. Um, and see what they're doing. And then the last piece is don't forget micro conversions. Um, so, you know, I talked a lot about generating more sales or more leads, but before a visitor gets to that point, um, they have to view a product before they can put a product in a shopping cart, before they can get to the checkout process, before they can get to the credit card process, before they're a sale. So, when you're looking at these, look at all the different micro conversions that you want people to be doing on the website and optimize for those. In that way, you'll build engagement, you'll get people's trust. They need to visit a number of pages. Think about when's the last time you went to a website and made a purchase in four pages? There's four in the shopping cart alone. You've got to get those, that activity up, get people interacting with your product or service first. Cool. Um, so that's sort of just measuring. I'm going to do my best in 10 minutes to cover three main forms of testing that we employ. Uh, one of which you probably won't ever employ, but I'll put it on here anyways. The first one is the simplest A-B testing. Um, and there's a bunch of different software platforms out there that enable you to say, I want to go to this page and create a new version. Um, you can do it with a WYSIWYG editor for the most part. You can make these changes and the, the software will send half the visitors to one and half the visitors to the other. And you tell it what you're measuring, I want to measure sales. Um, and, you know, boom, just like that, you've got a split test, you've got some results, and you may start to improve things. Real case scenario, the folks over who make SimCity um, hypothesized that by featuring a pre-order offer on a particular product that was available for purchase right now, they may have been distracting people from making a real-time purchase. So all they did was split test removing that silly little banner. It's not even the prettiest page here because now there is no graphic. But 43% increase in checkout just by taking away distraction. This is the sorts of power that Simplified we see. Simplified it, yep. Mm -hmm. yep. How do you know when your results are significant and it's not just random noise? So most of these, most of these will have a uh, significance built in. I can talk a little more about significance later. Um, I do have it on there, you see. But um, yeah, so most of them will have a statistical sampling put in there um, and let you know. So A-B testing is, is really good. It's easy to start. You know, just about all of us can do it. it all, most of them have a WYSIWYG editor, so even a dumb marketer like me can do these things. ID, I'm allowed to. Um, and they're good for really simple changes. Like if you want to change or remove an image or make some changes to text or a call to action, you know, the real basic, simple formatting. Um, but a couple of the weaknesses. Number one, there's a flicker potential. Because what you're doing is inserting code to change on the fly, if you made a lot of big changes, your users may see a thing really quickly before it quickly changes to the others. There are some codes, if that's a problem, you can go get um, that will make the whole page wait to display anything until the test version is ready to go. Um, but that's why I usually recommend this for things that people won't even notice. Like if a call to action is moving, that's just kind of a normal experience of a screen painting itself and the CSS is uploading. So um, it's a poor choice 
for huge changes. Um, like if you want to change a major template or big CSS changes, this isn't the tool for you. What is the tool for you is what's called a split URL test. Um, so if you have the capabilities to build a completely new version of the page that you want to test, um, these same software will enable you to just send half your traffic to page A, half your traffic to page B, and again, they'll bring in the modeling um, of the success and give you your reports on, on you know, what kind of conversion lift you can see and whether or not it's statistically relevant. Um, the problem with the split URL test, obviously, is you've got to have some coding skills. You've got to be able to build a whole second page. You can do it in WordPress, obviously. Um, but you've got to know a little something more. I'm not allowed to do these kinds of tests again because I'm a marketer. Uh, faster implementation of the winner, though, because if you decide version B was a better version after all, in the A-B test, you've only got it in a WYSIWYG editor. Now you've got to ask somebody to design that change for the whole site. Usually in the split URL test, you have the code ready to go. So if you're really confident that you're going to have a winner, um, it may be better to go with the split URL. Um, it's really good for the large scale changes, the template changes, or entire website redesigns before you go live with them. But you do need to know how to code. You have to be careful from an SEO standpoint because you're putting a duplicate version of a page out there. So again, talk with your SEO people to make sure that you've robots texted one away from the world until you're ready for it to be live. And it's difficult to do with more than two versions, like a three split gets a little complicated, um, and it's really only good for sort of a, a large-scale A-B test. All right, Shutter, the last one, uh, is called the multivariate test. So this is where you've got an idea for a landing page, but what you'd really like to test is, oh, I got a couple of headlines that I think would be good, um, but I've also got a couple of images that I think would be good. Uh, if I built in the A-B test, I would have to build you know, four versions, and then I don't know how they interact with each other, because sometimes maybe headline one and image two just resonate so well together. So fortunately, some of these tools um, that we'll talk about, that we have, offer what's called multivariate. And what you do is you just plop, okay, I want to test the headline section, I want to test the image section. I have these two variations for each of these, and it will, on the fly, build all four different variations that are possible. And it'll track the conversions from those four different variations. And it will actually tell you which combination is the best combination of those. Um, so you can take this to its logical conclusion and say, well, wait, I also want to test my call to action and I have two of those versions. Keep in mind the number of possibilities that uh, increases with each one of these um, by its multiplicative factor. So if I've got two headlines and two images, I have four versions. If I want to add two call to actions, I've got eight versions. If I wanted to make that three calls to action, I got 12 versions. So it's really easy to get carried away with multivariate testing to the point where you simply can't get a big enough sample size. Um, and that is one of its biggest weaknesses. Beware too many variables and variations. I've seen people get really excited by this idea and then say, what I want to test is, you know, is all these different things. And you point out, that's wonderful. you got 56 different variations here. By the time we get enough visitors to 56 variations, we could have split test something a long time ago and gotten some real learnings. So what is it good for? It's good for when you're really far down. Uh, Geico uses this a lot, actually. They figured out a long time ago what that perfect landing page template looks like. And all they want to do now is start testing messaging. So it's really good for when you're far down the funnel. And when I talk about the funnel, a testing funnel looks something like this. Um, and like I always say, let's test big before we test small. Before we start worrying about headlines or you know, the text in a call to action or what everybody loves to get started on is the color of a button, <laughs> which invariably hardly matters. Start with your big tests. Make sure that you're testing layout and themes and templates and that the whole site structure is really good. Uh, you can incorporate some navigation and cart funnel at this level as, to, at this level as well. Um, but then, and only then, once you've gotten your themes and your layout defined and the navigation working the best, we really start to then drive more people for calls to action, or maybe trusting the image placements or the offers with an A-B test. And then, once we've got that really refined, 
this is where we get down into testing the, mine, the, the minor pieces. Because each one of these down here is going to start giving us very limited benefits versus over what we get up there. I did promise you this list. These are just a few of the tools I have bookmarked and subscribed to. Um, they all have their own strengths and their own weaknesses. Um, you can go explore them. Some of them are mostly good for, like click tail and click heat, are really good for measuring baselines. Um, and they have a more powerful heat mapping engine. Visual website optimizer, Optimizely and Freshworks have really powerful A-B testing and multivariate testing engines. So, you know, I, I just encourage you to explore them, test them. They almost all have 14-day trials. Give it a whirl, see if it works with your application. If it doesn't, don't get frustrated, move on to another one. They just, they, they all, they all crack the nut a little differently. Uh, any questions before I just move on to some testing ideas? Cool. But Mike, what can I test? Glad you asked. Um, <laughs> There's just a few ideas that I came up with, sort of spitballing the last couple days, things that we've tested. You know, form length, what it fields are in there. Have you tested a two-step form where you ask for a little bit of information, and then on the next screen you say, hey, but wait, we'd like to know a little bit more about you, and then you've already captured at least a name and an email. Love it. Arranging the fields, you know, what kind of headlines, what do you put in there for your field defaults, your prompts? And these are all things that will help people with their usability. Uh, buttons, yes, I put colors here, but don't worry too much about colors. But where are your buttons, your call to action? What text is in them? What's their hover state? People often forget, you know, that positive influence just on at least a desktop. What's the hover state look like for these buttons? Images, super important actually. One of my favorite split tests was somebody who just reversed an image. It was a picture, it was a landing page, picture of a woman and a form. She's looking over here, and the form's over here. All they did was reverse the image so that she was looking at the form. Human nature likes to follow where somebody else is looking. 60% increased interaction with the form. So nothing is too stupid to test. Uh, navigation. <laughs> That's not true. Huh? Uh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you can test and improve it with stupid later. Okay. <laughs> the ideas are dumb. The tests aren't. Anyway. <laughs> So there you go. I mean, there's just a whole bunch um, of tests, test opportunities. Um, shorter forms are better. Always test the assumptions, right? We've all been here. Oh my lord, you have to have the shortest form, the least friction as possible. Real study, landing people on this page. You can't get much shorter than that. There's only three required fields, and I was thinking, oh, maybe the zip code is putting people off. We had horrible interactions with this form. People just weren't using it. Well, we decided, you know what, we better break the mold on this one. So we tested this form, which, you know, this, this is just completely against the grain. This, yeah. this couldn't be a more convoluted, complex form. 300% left in conversions on it, because what this form ended up doing was telling the user, we know our stuff. We're not just going to have some lame old sales guy call you. We want to know a lot of information about the custom workstations that your lab, like UMass, wants. And it's amazing. We're now, we're now loading up various versions of this form, and they're getting longer, and they, the longer they get, the more people seem to want to fill this thing out. Maybe it's just facilities just, managers are gluttons for it. To Derek, to Derek just didn't work there. They wanted, they wanted to know that you knew, yeah. that, that you were speaking their language. That's why I say it shocked me, but it, so that was, I thought, a stupid test, but that yeah, was the stupid one. Proven. Um, social proof. Add social proof. So this is a, a company that was eliciting uh, donations. Um, they weren't getting a lot. It was, it was average. And they just dropped in this little section here, which is a fact and how your donation is used, as well as um, Fortune 500, you know, different mentions in the press. Um, social proof. 11% uh, increase in donations on that page just by, by telling people right away that we are a trustworthy organization. Um, back to this one. Again, it was just like a simple test. I had to put it back out here. <laughs> how, how many pages do you have out there that if you could just eliminate an image and get 43% increase in sales? I think most of my clients would love that. And then the last one, um, you know, think about some clarity in the calls to action. Uh, what we saw here, with the, with the, and the images are different, I'm sorry. It was the uh, site-wide test of buttons across the site. Um, by simply changing the text to add to cart, 49% increased people adding to cart. You know, I think we like to get really tricky with our 
our icons and our logos and think people will understand, but you got to test it and make sure that your particular audience understands. And my last few parting thoughts, wrap it up and I save five minutes for questions. Um, so here's the harsh reality. I was really optimistic, wasn't I? See, that's the marketer in me again. One in eight tests are going to drive a significant change. One in eight. That means seven in eight of the tests that you run are going to fail, they're going to be a tie, or they're going to look marginally successful. Um, and then I, I will posit that the marginal gains are failures as well. Um, they probably almost always go away with a retest. So don't give up. Um, you just never know what's going to work or what's not going to work. But the process plays out if you keep iterating that one in eight that drives significant change uh, will, will improve the websites. And then it's like compounded interest. The next time you get your next one in eight winner, it's going to be built off of your previous one in eight winner. Um, failing to measure before testing is just you guessing. Um, you definitely want to measure, hypothesize, hypothesize, measure. Whatever you do, don't just say, I want to test these buttons first. Make sure that was a real problem by going back and measuring. Um, statistical significance. So funny enough, my fisheries biology set me up for stats. Um, I did a lot of it. And stats works really well with <clears throat> large sample sizes. Um, and and you know it can be pretty predictive. What I found in this world of marketing is humans suck when it comes to statistics. They don't follow it. So what I say is, you know, Look for these differences. Wait until you get something that says it's probably statistically relevant. But for goodness sake, when you implement a winner, measure again. Because I've seen those winners go live. And then and when they do a run of sight, when they become the whole world, it's gone or it's been a negative impact. So you have to measure again after implementation. Don't trust that your test results really were great. It's, you just got to keep the process going. Um, and don't forget, you know, you're doing a lot of one-page tests. They might not scale site-wide. That's where that seven and eight losers come from. It looked like it was a winner on the landing page, and it turns out it was a winner on just the landing page for just the vegan, gluten-free, eco, granola people. Uh, and then lastly, opinions don't matter. Visitors matter and success matters. So you know, throw away your ideas of what a website design is supposed to be. Go ahead and accept that somebody's opinion, you know, might be right, it might be wrong. Throw it out there. A lot of these, if you've got a high volume website, which you know we represent some people who do, you can run a test on just five or ten percent of the website population and get results. Most people will never even know. And then, hey, you may be shocked to find out that that form with with what 39 fields actually beat the one before. Cool. And lastly, don't forget to give your feedback. Um, I know that they, they value the feedback that will help the summit get better and it will help the summit continue. So with that, I thank you all. And now it turns out I only saved you three minutes for questions. Um, as a design and development consultant, I'm wondering who owns the data, the consultant or the client or both? So, so typically we, we'll send it along. Um, we'll take the reports. Uh, and it depends with the client, like do they own the A-B testing platform, in which case they have a history of all those tests. Um, some clients will do enough that we set them up with their own instance of, say, Fresh Market or Visual Website Optimizer. Mm -hmm. um, but in the end, we typically like to make sure we hand them a report, screenshots of all the tests so they have a repository in the future. But it's up to you. Determine either the length or the number of people you want to test before you think you'll get measurable results. And that's where the uh, the platforms themselves are really good. Um, it really depends on how different the results are. So a page that's only got a five percent lift in add to carts um, may require five thousand visitors to each page to become statistically relevant. Um, whereas one that's got uh, 125% increase might only need a thousand visitors per page. So you can let the engine sort of let you know. And they all have that built in. I can't remember what one they run. It's like an omega chi squared test um, or student T. You know, they all have a different model. Uh, but they will let you know. It looks like it'll take you this many more visitors to get statistically relevant. But at some point, you might just decide, you know, I'm seeing a 5% lift in the number of people adding to cart. Uh, it says I'm not statistically relevant yet, but what's the danger? 
of going live with that particular test. Um, so in some cases, we don't wait for the engine to say, this is relevant, this is statistically significant. Um, we just say, the danger of launching this one is so tiny, let's give it a try and see if in the real world we, we get that same lift. Right. I mostly ask this. I work with small clients, uh, small businesses, and so I have a tendency to um, you know, do the best that I can to help them, but they might not have the amount of reach, you know, when you're talking about Amazon versus a yeah. local business that has a online store right. trying to gather the same amount of information and they just don't have that same reach. It's, it's how much longer is it going to take? How would you want those questions to be asked? Yeah, you probably will. And so, they also, a lot of those folks, I know Visual Website Optimizer has a calculator for that. So if you know the number of visitors that come to their website, you can plug that in and say, I'm going to do a split test. And then you can just get a sense, like if this is going to be a 5 or 10% lift, this is how many visitors it's going to take us to get there. And you can just set their expectations. We do that before we engage in a split testing program with clients, just to let them know how many we can effectively do in the course of a month. That's how we price it. Like, if we're going to do 10 tests a month, we price ourselves in a particular way. But if they don't have enough visitors, we can't do 10 tests a month. We can do two, or maybe one every other month. But yeah, go visit. The tools are really handy for helping you predict how long it'll take to get something useful and set expectations. If they did that math, or if I had to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, they, they've set it up so that you just plug in the, the values. It's pretty, pretty easy. Okay. <laughs> I have dyslexia and numbers are Excellent. Well, if there's no other questions, I can unrecord and say goodbye to the. Oh, go ahead. I had another question, but you can unrecord right. and say goodbye. Bye, YouTube. Uh